Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Nir Zavaro. Nir has been in uh, marketing, branding for many years. He just came up with his new book, F the Slides, which is all about storytelling. Enjoy my conversation with Nir Zavaro. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with uh, Nir Zavaro. Nir has had his own agency. He's now uh, shifting his business and going into teaching. But this guy has been all over the place. He's done everything from sales, building businesses, writing novels, teaching thousands of students, and, and working with so many different companies. I'm extremely happy to have him on the podcast as well because he is launching now uh, his new book, which is F the Slides, which, you know, uh, I have a lot of uh, audience in America. So as a Belgian-born person, I, I don't mind saying the F word, but that's F the Slides, but it's about storytelling and it's about using that storytelling to convince people. In other words, this guy know a thing or two about storytelling, about marketing, about communication. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Nir Zavaro. I'm going to use that. Uh, I'll send this piece to my mother. She'll be very proud. <laughs> what a great opener, man. I'm so happy to be here. Every time I get the chance to take a break from life and do these things, I'm happy. You know? And that's exactly what we decide that we're going to focus only on the book, on the business side, and take a break from life. Uh, and focus on uh, all the great things that you have in this book. But first thing first, Nir, what is your journey? I think it's a, a combination between learning and teaching. It's a, an interesting cycle. I've, I've always been an avid reader. I love learning new things. Sometimes I even love learning that I'm not very good at certain things. You know, like I'm not allowed to design. If you look at the book cover, I love the book cover. And people buy the book and they say, I just bought the book. By the way, the, the cover is amazing. And every time I'll forward that message to my designer. But <laughs> me, I'm not, I'm not supposed to design anything. So I think learning is a big thing. And then when you implement your learnings as a teaching concept, and I've been teaching at universities and colleges for the last 10 years, and hearing a freshman year student ask a question, you're like, wow, why didn't I think of it? And so for me, that means I will always be that student. And I think that's my journey. And, and the book, uh, if the slides for the sake of this conversation, is, and I think, such a big thing for me because I thought I can teach a way of thinking. It took me two years to implement that. And the reason why it's a book first is, is because I want people to be able to learn by themselves. And I can't meet everyone. I can't do a workshop all over the world. I'm trying, but I can't. So that's a big, big thing. By the way, a quick thing about the F or not, when we were working on the, the book, I always have a title first. And then I'm like, ah, now I have to write it. There were a lot of discussions. Uh, forget the slides, uh, fork the pitch. There were a lot of variations, even only F and so on. And I even agreed to do it once, to change. And I learned that if you believe in something, don't change it, whatever happens. Mm. So we, we, we just launched. Uh, number one bestseller for I don't know Amazon on on meetings and presentations, but I'm not allowed to promote <laughs> because of the name. <laughs> so, but look at the interesting thing: I'm not allowed to promote, which 99% means I'm going to lose. Or patient enough, I have a good book, I have a good methodology that you can implement. I'm going to pay that price. But every person that I meet or hears my talks and says, "Wow, I love the title. I have to read it." That's great. And I'm, I want to be a product and marketing. I don't want to be a, a promotion that does what the platform asks me. Absolutely. No, and it's very interesting for me, uh, as I was mentioning earlier on, a Belgian-born American citizen. And so in Belgium and in Europe, uh, saying the F word, it's, it's almost like a between bracket, a cool thing. Uh, but it's definitely not vulgar or the way it is taken here in America. And I re clearly remember when Bono, uh, received, the, I don't know if it was the, um, one of those, those prizes with the Emmy Awards or something very, very important. He was on stage. He was so happy. He was excited. Anyone is effing cool. And the next day you had people, how could he do that? We have to uh, scrub him from his prize. I was like, really? But anyway. It's an important word. Why? It 
always gets a reaction. So some people will like it. Some people will say, oh, now everybody uses it. Mm. Some people feel a bit mm, uncomfortable about it, but it always gets a reaction. The reason why I'm using that is because when I was working with startups to help them implement their marketing and it didn't ex exactly work, and we said, okay, let's first fix uh, the demo day, the presentations, and then we'll talk about the marketing. They always came back with the slides, never with the story. Mm. And then you give them feedback, they go back, they come back with slides. And at a certain point, they said, you know what? F, F the slides. I don't want to see, it. we'll never talk about slides again. And that resonated with people. And I said, hmm, finally they get it. And it's a nice way to get a reaction from my audience, but it's also a nice way to scream, if you want. Right. Audience. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's an easy word to pronounce as well. Yeah. Somebody say the three most difficult words to pronounce are, I love you. I'm sorry, and Worcester shower sauce. Yeah, Worcester uh, sauce is, uh, I think, the most complicated, I think. Right. It's the toughest. So you had your uh, own agency now for 13 years, I believe. So w yeah. when did you start and, and why did you start your agency? Uh, I started my agency because I, I didn't have anything else to do in life, and I lost all my money, and I was living on friends' couches which is a normal reason to start a business. <laughs> right. Um, when I was in the army, I read a novel. It was a good novel. Today is one of the most famous in my country. And um, I said, uh, that's it. It's very easy. One day when I have time, I'll write a novel. And I, I, it stuck with me for years. And then I read the second novel. And I said, uh, one day I'll do it. I was working in sales, marketing, brand management, uh, global brands, and stuff like that. We were selling snowboards in Israel in the desert. Um, by the way, that's why I think I'm, we're good salespeople. If I can sell you a thousand euros worth of snowboard equipment in 30 degrees and flip flops, trust me, I can sell anything. And, and 30 that, degrees Celsius. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how you calculate that in Fahrenheit. It's uh, 80, 85. Uh, yeah, I would say probably 85, yeah. yeah. Um, like you see, I did my homework. And um, I went to work for the um, uh, a, a government job, everything. Like, my life was very weird. And then someone convinced me to open a club, a bar. Who doesn't want to be a bar owner? You know, and I didn't like my government job. It was not for me. And uh, it was very successful. Like, tabloids and stuff. And celebrities but that lasted a few months and then went really bad and and we lost all the money and we had to close and sell it and um i found myself with debt i know there was a hundred thousand dollars debt no job no bar no nothing uh, i couldn't afford the rent so i went to work for my friend's restaurant at the, the, at the restaurant they would do the checker to make sure the dishes go out the, the the right way when they leave between the kitchen and the waitress And uh, I did that because uh, it was four hours a day, every evening. The money was pretty good. And you can eat whatever you want at the end of the, the shift. And uh, I spent my weekends on friends' couches and then on another friend over the next weekend. And I didn't have anything to do. And I went back to promoting parties to get free drinks. And I was very, very happy. I had nothing to my name. I was very happy. And I said, oh, shit, you know what? I have time. And I remember I said, I'll write a book. So I'll do it. And I started to write a novel about the nightlife of Tel Aviv, because I always said, I'm going to write. But I said, I also need to make money somehow. So I said, okay, okay, I learned my lesson. After 10 years, I know. And I've done all these small ventures in the summertime when we didn't sell snowboards. I said, okay, so what do we need? No rent, because it was very expensive at the bar. No employees, because who wants to deal with employees? No inventory. It's too complicated. I imported. We sold. The, forget about it. Lastly, uh, I like traveling. So I want to do it from any place that I can open a laptop. And uh, that was, I think, 2011. And I said, hmm, there was no digital nomad at the time. So it was kind of like uh, consulting. And Streetwise has been a domain that I've owned since 2005. And every time I, I had this pet project i would use that domain so i said yeah we'll use that streetwise is a good name i'm streetwise why not 
And that's how it started. And it, it grew quite nicely. I went up working with big companies from uh, Microsoft and Unilever and uh, Ito, which is a $10 billion company, and a lot of others. Um, I've been extremely privileged to work with amazing people. I usually hired juniors, and they would grow in the company until there was not nowhere else for them to grow in the company. They would leave. We're still in good relations. Now with the book launch, all of them are written in the book. And so it's been a, an interesting journey to learn how to scale a business while teaching your employees and then learning from them as they keep growing. Some of them today have amazing businesses, amazing roads in tech companies. I, I like the way you say that you, you're teaching people, but you're also learning from them. There's always, always something to learn. You've been at so, this for 13 years, very successful. And then you said, nah, no, I'm not happy. I want something else. Tell us a little bit, take us through the, this process. The, what, what happened in your mind? Was it a forum discussion in EO or um, what triggered that change? I think end of 2019, I realized that I can probably do a niche business doing outsource marketing and not so much consulting. Like we've, we've transitioned more tech companies and we can do it with a very small business while I can keep working on concepts because at the end of the day service you know how it is it's draining there's only a certain amount of years you want to do it and then you have to do it and then you're outdated and when it comes to marketing if you don't keep doing it day in day out i read two hours a day just to keep up in six months if i keep stop reading i'll be out all day and um i laid out the concept for the company and everything 2020 is going to be our year and i'm going to travel the world and teach and then oh, yeah. I came to Berlin. I know I uploaded the video that I'm going to travel to 100 cities in a year and teach. Went to Berlin, came back COVID. And the whole concept went to smithereens and I had to start again. We lost most of the clients we had at the time. And I thought I want to focus back on the basics. So I learned how to edit video, recording, a weekly newsletter that scaled very nicely about stuff I read. So why not share with you? I'm learning. You should also learn. And it became a thing. And I went back to, I want to write. I want to teach in a different way. Maybe I'll come up with some ideas. And I started to write a lot. And I think that helped me. Writing in general helps you put on paper, definitely on paper, not on the, necessarily on your laptop, um, where you are, where you want to go, and why. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, I wanted to write and teach. I wanted to keep doing this. And I also understood that it ran its course. There's a certain amount of years. Maybe it ran its course. And um, moving forward, I think, I managed to rebuild the company in terms of finances and go back and do some things. We've had amazing clients. And 2022, I realized that I'm either shifting or changing, but I need to take my ideas and share them. We can then discuss if they're good or not, and they will improve. And I think some of them are amazing. And you know how it is. It's a, a draft after draft. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started a new company called uh, Zavaroness.com. What does Zavaroness mean? So Zavaro is uh, my surname. Yeah. And um, like happiness, so Zavaroness. And I used to date uh, an amazing girl, a very wise. She was a, an old soul and a very young person. And uh, she loved joining me to sales meeting and consulting. She said, you know, there's this thing when they finish the meeting with you that they feel they can, they like it. They're so happy about it or exhilarated about like they can conquer the world. And she said, every time I go with you, that's how they leave. It's like Zavonis, you have this thing. And uh, we broke up, but I still have a t-shirt that says Zavonis when I go to the <laughs> workshop. And it means the feeling, the state of mind, a contagious sense you can accomplish anything. And if we come together to do it, it worked. And, and it also, it became kind of like my anchor. And, and my title at the company is Chief of Happiness and not CEO. Because again, it's an anchor that you can keep. Am, am I in the same place or am I becoming a bit of a, uh, am I a jerk? Am I okay? Am I doing, am I happy? That's what you want to spread. And so you decide to go all in. In, in this new uh, venture and to start writing a book. So tell us a little bit about the, the book. Tell me what I should be learning because I'm 
I heard so much about your work and the presentation you made. So I'm eagerly waiting because I, I bought 10 copies that I, I want to <laughs> share with, with some friends, but I hadn't got a chance to read it yet. <laughs> so tell me a little bit what I'm going to be discovering, the book, uh, discovering in the book. Yeah. So I started to work with startups on their um, marketing things. But when I would ask them, what do you do? How can I help you? I didn't understand what they do. And I said, can you please do me a kind favor and explain in one sentence, what do you actually do? And they would start arguing in the meeting between them. Now they raised money. I'm like, guys, this is weird. Oh, girls, this is. And then I thought their brands are not built. I understand. They don't understand exactly what they do, but they already raised money. And now they're going to a demo day. And then you go to a demo day. And again, 10 companies would present. I don't understand what they do. They're not inspiring. They're not interesting. They will change the world for sure if someone understands what they do. <laughs> and I said, what if I could fix that? Because the ideas are amazing. The founders are amazing. The co like Everything's amazing. Something's not working. What's not working? And I realized that they were so focused on putting all the information into the three-minute pitch. They were so focused on not missing any piece of details because they don't know what will stick when you throw the spaghetti on the wall. They were so focused on making a nicely designed slide that they forgot to tell me a story. And I believe that we are all storytellers. You and I are now telling stories. That's what we do. And tonight you set the table, dinner with family, and everybody will tell a story. And you go in the morning to the company and you have a meeting. And we all know how these meetings, right? You go in, you talk about the weather. Then we talk about the parking. And then we start talking about other stuff. And I said, what if I can fix that? What if... I believe that me, as someone who loves stories, what if we change the concept? What if storytelling is not a soft skill? What if storytelling is a must skill? What if we cannot use that buzzword again because it sucks? It doesn't mean anything. We all know, okay, storytelling. And a startup would get that 10 times a day. You need to add storytelling. What does it really mean? And I said, wait, I'm working with companies and I'm helping startups uh, raise capital because we're able to build that concept, that story. So that means I'm doing something the same way. What if I could extract that from my mind, teach it, turn it into a method? And fuck the slides is the methodology of how to create or, or collect the information, create the story, measure, KPI the story, and then understand how to share it in the right steps. By the way, three minutes is, is an amazing time because when you tell a startup or any company, or if I tell any person that listens to that podcast, to this podcast, go into the next meeting and you have three minutes to pitch your company. 99% of people will say the same thing. Three minutes, I can't do it in three minutes. I need at least 10, 15 minutes to explain what we do. I would argue you do not. And if I say, you know what, forget about the three minutes. I'll give you an article in the newspaper, 500 words, main page. You can write whatever you want. They say, ah, it's amazing. But in the book, I explain this is roughly the same thing. Five minutes is about 300 words, uh, 500 words in English. That's a three minutes, roughly. So that means we have enough. But we're so focused on trying to put all the information. We're so focused on putting all the information in the slides that we forgot the most important thing. When I'm now pitching to you, I am the presentation. And I'm not prepared. So if I'm not prepared, wait, I'm improvising? You're asking for a million dollars, but you're improvising? This is weird. And with that notion, I said, what if I taught you how to become a better storyteller and there's a structure? And every chapter in the book takes you from helping you understand that you're a good storyteller to understanding how your audience reacts and thinks, which, by the way, is universal. People are people all over the world. They have the same wants, the same desires, the same passions and stuff. Again, some people might be the extremists, but the general public works the same. Mm. So that means that if you're reaching to them and giving them information, that's not how they communicate. By the way, when we really want to talk about sales, the data points or the information is the last thing and not the first thing. And I'll explain. When we interact between people for now, so now we are, you and I are talking and I'm telling you the story and everything I'm saying makes us feel a certain way. And you agree or disagree or, ah, what he's saying, it's uncomfortable. I like it. You know what? It makes me feel good. 
So basically, the currency is an emotion. It has nothing to do with what I am actually saying or the information I'm giving you. Now, when we today present, we use slides as the spine for everything. And I would claim this is the wrong thing. What we need to do is use the text. And why? Because 7% of all the communication when I present is the verbal, and 93 is the, the nonverbal. I didn't invent the, the concept. By the way, there's different numbers for different things, but the general idea stick. So it means that in order for me to know if I'm happy, sad, we all know what these emotions because they're universal. But if I haven't written the text, I don't know how to build everything on top of the spine. And that's where people are mistaken. Now, people are afraid to write because they fear that then they cannot change. So they say, no, I prefer to improvise. Truth be told, that is an opening to make too many mistakes. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, then people say, I don't know how to write, or I'm not a storyteller, to which I reply in the book and I explain it. It's fine. But if it's a must skill and you haven't practiced it, of course, you're not good. People are not writing every day 500 words about their business. They write it once at the best and go to pitch their company over and over with a bad presentation. Absolutely. Now, when you have this presentation and uh, you say you do on slides, how about using images or a keyword, like one word or, or uh, images and, and speak on the images? Because images also create emotions when, when you see them, right? So if we understand that there's the emotion aspect of how, what is the currency we're trading? And then there's the experience, okay? So you said um, Belgium. I remember 2018, I came to a talk in Belgium. I was with a camera guy, it was cold. We're walking down the street, we were hungry. And we saw this fish and chips. And I told him, we, we, you should have this fish and chips. And he said, who has fish and chips? We don't have fish and chips at home. I said, no, 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 trust me. And it was an amazing fish and chips. Now, if I will tell you to walk down a restaurant, a road, a coffee place, a club, you will use your experience and you will put yourself there. So that means I can control what I want you to see. So I can make you feel happy and I can control where you're happy, which is a lot. And if we look at all the information, you don't need all the information. You just need enough. In the workshops, there's a short story. I won't tell it now, but it's an idea. When you say, I met a friend, for example, you didn't tell me everything that led up to that. That piece of information, all those pieces are not relevant for the story. I can imagine you didn't show up naked. Imagine. So that means in the, la the third part, my mind doesn't need all the information. I can fill the gaps. Now, when I write a novel, what's a novel, my friend? A novel is only... White paper and black ink. That's it. You fill the gap. Very nice. The last mm -hmm. part is if everything I say sticks and I told you that this offer costs $1,000, you will go home and you will tell to your spouse, no, we should get it. $1,000 is a very good deal. So the sale in itself, you're selling yourself. I'm not selling to you. So the slides in most cases, hurt us from first creating the story and then when we are presenting. So if I am the presentation and I want to have slides, which a startup today that pitches to get money, to raise capital, mm -hmm. cannot show up without slides. It's very uncommon, very. Right. Might happen in very specific cases or they might ask, ah, don't just let's talk. But in general, they will have the 10 slides. Yeah. And the slides will have two options. They are either a scenery or they play a supporting role. And in the book, I explain how it works. So I'm not saying that. There's a whole chapter about slides. But you need to use them smart in a smart way. Scenery, supporting role. Now, everything I just mentioned now, when you bring it all together, three minutes, the pitch, the slides you have, and everything, that is what I like to call in the book, the trailer pitch. Three minutes. I don't need to sell you. I just need to be interesting enough that you want to know more. Right. I need to take you from this to, hmm, that's it. Absolutely. So it takes the, the edge off. So now you're, you're specifically talking about startup, which I totally get. 
And I remember all those 10 slides that I think uh, Guy Kawasaki came up with that. Uh, it's, it's used in, in all uh, tech. It's great. What about a presentation that you're doing in a workshop? What about a presentation that you're doing uh, as a keynote? Uh, and what about the slides in that case? Great. Let's cover one thing. The way you do a presentation for a, a company that raises millions, everything you do in a sales meeting or stuff like that should be the same. That means that we are having a discussion and I need to present my company or my concept. I need to have the trailer pitch done. Then the meeting will continue to everything else. Mm. Q&A, discussion, relevant, not relevant, and so on. But the three minute must be there. And we teach that and we implement that and it works in meetings in a, a profound uh, a way for some of the people that are saying, ah, oh, I used to struggle. I don't know what I'm going to say. Now I know it works. And then there's the extension for that meeting, which has what we call um, the Babylon Day. Babylon was the old city. In old times, they say they had almost 400,000 people, the biggest library on the planet, all the languages, all the history, everything was there. Mm. That means that everything that doesn't fit the three minutes, but will fit in a different part of the meeting or the discussion will go there. One of our clients, um, I think I mentioned that in the book, had 67 or 69 different slides. They don't show all of them. Right. But it shows that I came prepared, that I know what you're going to talk about. Here I can have more text and more stuff. Okay. And then it's very, very important. To your question about a keynote, and I'm not addressing that in the book, there's a few pointers for that. If this is a must skill and you will practice, and by the way, I started speaking in public from, I went to teach in college. You know why? The, the hardest audience. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you speak to startup founders, to tech companies, to entrepreneurs like you and I. At the end, even if it wasn't good, they'll say, ah, thank you. That's very nice. And they'll go. <laughs> A student will stand up in class and say, hey, teach. Uh, I'm not sure this is, especially where I come from. Mm -hmm. Okay. They'll call bullshit. So for me, every 90 minutes that I had to teach, and 90 minutes, once a week, sometimes four classes, the same class, yeah. brand management, 90 minutes to hold a very tough audience. So for me, for example, it was always about wrapping everything in one story, the Ferrari story, the Happy Sock story, the Zappo story. Everything goes into a bigger, and then it's divided into chapters or episodes. And then you can decide how you summarize it. So I have a workshop called From Branding to Marketing and the Journey in Between. It will be the next book, by the way. I'm already working on it. And I believe that all the things we thought were the right way to build a brand are wrong. And in today's modern world, now we're seeing the core values do not uphold in 90% of the companies. Mm -hmm. Companies come, they're amazing, and they disappear. Most companies don't have a DNA, a language and stuff. And the workshop is a three-hour workshop where the audience works about 50% of the time. So I need to make sure that in every section, they have the time to absorb the relevant things. Mm -hmm. I even today have slides where I tell people, these are the slides you need to take a picture of. People love to take pictures of slides. Most of them will never look at them again, but it's nice in the middle of the workshop. Yeah. So I stop, I pause, I pause, I take a pause, they take the picture, it's very nice. When you give, in my opinion, something that needs to have more text and you are well prepared for that session, you don't show the slide and then talk about it. Rather, mm -hmm. it supports mm -hmm. what you need. Okay. I love so it. you'll yeah. go through it. And I think that's a key for people to understand. I'm prepared. If the projector doesn't work, I'm also fine. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love it. But I can use that in the sessions to make sure what are the key things I want to uh, move on or transfer. By the way, again, it's important to say I don't teach public speaking. I believe there's a chapter in the book where I believe that once you understand the emotions and the key elements, what happens is you know at which exact word you need to be excited, where do you need to be quiet. You know. But if you haven't written, 
the text, if you haven't written the key messages, if you haven't written the emotions, and by the way, you know this from EO, what's the one thing and uh, the emotions attached to it? Yeah. Why aren't you doing it in every meeting? I love it. And, and I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, okay, so um, I have uh, several stories that uh, you know that you've practiced. And the second thing is um, exercising, practicing, practicing, practicing. I do remember, and I'll never forget, the first time I spoke in public, I was a member of a student organization called ISEC. I had to speak in front of 180 people. And it was in Tranum, in the north of Denmark. And it was in 1989, I believe 1989, or one of those years. And I was prepared, I rehearsed. I was so freaking scared that my lips was thick here and I didn't have any more saliva. So I spent the whole hour just basically putting my lips down. And at the end, I asked feedback. People say, it's great, but what's with the lips? I said, no, I was so scared. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I did it once, I can do it again. But even till today, uh, if I have to make a presentation, whether it's three minutes or an hour, I rears, I rears, I rears. I think it was uh, Churchill who said, um, if you need me to talk for 10 minutes, I need three uh, days to prepare. If you want me to talk for 30 minutes, I need the day. If you want me to talk for an hour or more, I can come now. Yeah, it was something like that. But uh, yeah, he he was amazing. at uh, And uh, also an amazing skill when uh, when writing speech. So near, I mean, we, we, we can uh, go on and on. Unfortunately, the podcast format is, you know, quite limited. Um, but I, I want to ask you this workshop that you're doing, your book, we're now in, in November, you booked through April. So uh, that's wonderful. Um, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, and, and if they want to work with you and, uh, and have you yeah. as a speaker uh, or uh, as a consultant? So nilzavaro.com is my website. Feel free to leave um, your details there. You can reach me on LinkedIn. It's easy. You can reach me on Instagram, nilzavaro, and uh, Instagram is nzavaro. And in general, I'd be happy to chat to anyone. The idea is to bring this to at least a million people. And people ask me, um, why a million people, right? This why Why do people choose a million people? And I always say, to be honest, it's a nice number. And between you and I, I'm not counting, so I'll never reach it. Me. The idea is to keep going. I'm not doing this to reach a certain goal. I'm doing this to hopefully inspire as many as we can to become better. Wonderful. I love this conversation. I can wait to read your book, F the Slides, from Nir Zavaro. My last question before we go, when we meet in one year, uh, in November 24, with a bottle of champagne, and a cigar. What are we going to celebrate? The signing the book deal for the next book after I sold 10,000 copies of this. Very nice. Nir, thank you so much for taking the time. Good luck on your tour. And uh, I can wait to uh, see you in person and listen to uh, your storytelling. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Nir, thank you so much for spending time with me. And as you say, it's good to. Uh, you know, do a podcast and um, escape a little bit uh, from life for 40 minutes. Uh, besides that, you share amazing insights. And thank you for that. It's going to be very helpful for those listening, including myself. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to connect with me, please go on LinkedIn or join the Facebook group www.eventbusinessformula.com slash group. And if you enjoy this conversation, please share it with your network. Thank you. Bye-bye.